How Successful People Think by John C. Maxwell Introduction Good thinkers are always in demand. A person who knows how may always have a job, but the person who knows why will always be his boss. Good thinkers solve problems, they never lack ideas that can build an organization, and they always have hope for a better future. Good thinkers rarely find themselves at the mercy of ruthless people who would take advantage of them or try to deceive them. People like Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler, who once boasted, what luck for rulers that men do not think. Those who develop the process of good thinking can rule themselves even while under an oppressive ruler or in other difficult circumstances. In short, good thinkers are successful. I've studied successful people for 40 years, and though the diversity you find among them is astounding, I've found that they are all alike in one way, how they think. That is the one thing that separates successful people from unsuccessful ones. And here's the good news. How successful people think can be learned. If you change your thinking, you can change your life. WH why you should change your thinking. It's hard to overstate the value of changing your thinking. Good thinking can do many things for you. Generate revenue, solve problems, and create opportunities. It can take you to a whole new level personally and professionally. It really can change your life. Consider some things you need to know about changing your thinking. Changed thinking is not automatic. Sadly, a change in thinking doesn't happen on its own. Good ideas rarely go out and find someone. If you want to find a good idea, you must search for it. If you want to become a better thinker, you need to work at it. And once you begin to become a better thinker, the good ideas keep coming. In fact, the amount of good thinking you can do at any time depends primarily on the amount of good thinking you are already doing. Changed thinking is difficult. When you hear someone say, now this is just off the top of my head, expect dandruff. The only people who believe thinking is easy are those who don't habitually engage in it. Nobel Prize winning physicist Albert Einstein, one of the best thinkers who ever lived, asserted, thinking is hard work, that's why so few do it. Because thinking is so difficult, you want to use anything you can to help you improve the process. Changed thinking is worth the investment. Author Napoleon Hill observed, more gold has been mined from the thoughts of man than has ever been taken from the earth. When you take the time to learn how to change your thinking and become a better thinker, you're investing in yourself. Gold mines tap out. Stock markets crash. Real estate investments can go sour. But a human mind with the ability to think well is like a diamond mine that never runs out. It's priceless. H-O-W to become a better thinker. Do you want to master the process of good thinking? Do you want to be a better thinker tomorrow than you are today? Then you need to engage in an ongoing process that improves your thinking. I recommend you do the following. Expose yourself to good input. Good thinkers always prime the pump of ideas. They always look for things to get the thinking process started, because what you put in always impacts what comes out. Read books, review trade magazines, listen to tapes, and spend time with good thinkers. And when something intrigues you whether it's someone else's idea or the seed of an idea that you have come up with yourself keep it in front of you. Put it in writing and keep it somewhere in your favorite thinking place to stimulate your thinking. Expose yourself to good thinkers. Spend time with the right people. As I worked on this section and bounced my ideas off of some key people, so that my thoughts would be stretched, I realized something about myself. All of the people in my life whom I consider to be close friends or colleagues are thinkers. Now, I love all people. I try to be kind to everyone I meet, and I desire to add value to as many people as I can through conferences, books, audio lessons, etc. But the people I seek out and choose to spend time with all challenge me with their thinking and their actions. They are constantly trying to grow and learn. That's true of my wife, Margaret, my close friends, and the executives who run my companies. Every one of them is a good thinker. The writer of Proverbs observed that sharp people sharpen one another, just as iron sharpens iron. If you want to be a sharp thinker, be around sharp people. Choose to think good thoughts. To become a good thinker, you must become intentional about the thinking process. Regularly put yourself in the right place to think, shape, stretch, and land your thoughts. Make it a priority. Remember, thinking is a discipline. Recently I had breakfast with Dan Cathy, 
the president of Czech Philly, a fast food chain headquartered in the Atlanta area. I told him that I was working on this book and I asked him if he made thinking time a high priority. Not only did he say yes, but he told me about what he calls his thinking schedule. It helps him to fight the hectic base of life that discourages intentional thinking. Dan says he sets aside time just to think for half a day every two weeks, for one whole day every month, and for two or three full days every year. Dan explains, this helps me keep the main thing. The main thing, since I am so easily distracted. You may want to do something similar, or you can develop a schedule and method of your own. No matter what you choose to do, go to your thinking place, take paper on pen, and make sure you capture your ideas in writing. Act on your good thoughts. Ideas have a short shelf life. You must act on them before the expiration date. World War I flying A said Rickenbacker said it all when he remarked. I can give you a six-word formula for success. Think things through. Then follow through. Allow your emotions to create another good thought to start the thinking process. You cannot rely on your feelings. In Failing Forward, I wrote that you can act your way into feeling long before you can feel your way into action. If you wait until you feel like doing something, you will likely never accomplish it. The same is true for thinking. You cannot wait until you feel like thinking to do it. However, I've found that once you engage in the process of good thinking, you can use your emotions to feed the process and create mental momentum. Try it for yourself. After you go through the discipline process of thinking and enjoy some success, allow yourself to savor the moment and try riding the mental energy of that success. If you're like me, it's likely to spur additional thoughts and productive ideas. Repeat the process. One good thought does not make a good life. The people who have one good thought and try to write it for an entire career often end up unhappy or destitute. They are the one hit wonders, the one book authors, the one message speakers, the one time inventors who spend their life struggling to protect or promote their single idea. Success comes to those who have an entire mountain of gold that they continually mine, not those who find one nugget and try to live on it for 50 years. To become someone who can mine a lot of gold. You need to keep repeating the process of good thinking. Putting yourself in the right place to think. Becoming a good thinker isn't overly complicated. It's a discipline. If you do the six things I have outlined, you will set yourself up for a lifestyle of better thinking. But what do you do to come up with specific ideas on a day-to-day -day basis? I want to teach you the process that I've used to discover and develop good thoughts. It's certainly not the only one that works, but it has worked well for me. Find a place to think your thoughts. If you go to your designated place to think expecting to generate good thoughts, then eventually you will come up with some. Where is the best place to think? Everybody's different. Some people think best in the shower. Others, like my friend Dick Biggs, like to go to a park. For me, the best places to think are in my car, on planes, and in the spa. Ideas come to me in other places as well, such as when I'm in bed. I keep a special lighted writing pad on my nightstand for such times. I believe I often get thoughts because I make it a habit to frequently go to my thinking places. If you want to consistently generate ideas, you need to do the same thing. Find a place where you can think, and plan to capture your thoughts on paper so that you don't lose them. When I found a place to think my thoughts, my thoughts found a place in me. Find a place to shape your thoughts. Rarely do ideas come fully formed and completely worked out. Most of the time, they need to be shaped until they have substance. As my friend Dan Ryland says, they have to stand the test of clarity and questioning. During the shaping time, you want to hold an idea up to strong scrutiny. Many times the thought that seemed outstanding late at night looks pretty silly in the light of day. Ask questions about your ideas. Fine-tune them. One of the best ways to do that is to put your thoughts in writing. Professor, college president, and U.S. Senator S.I. Hi Akawi wrote, learning to write is learning to think. You don't know anything clearly unless you can state it in writing. As you shape your thoughts, you find out whether an idea has potential. You learn what you have. You also learn some things about yourself. The shaping time thrills me because it embodies humor. The thoughts that don't work often provide comic relief. Humility. The moments when I connect with God or me. Excitement. 
I love to play it an idea mentally. I call it futuring it. Creativity. In these moments I am unhampered by reality. Fulfillment. God made me for this process. It uses my greatest gifts and gives me joy. Honesty. As I turn over an idea in my mind, I discover my true motives. Passion. When you shape a thought, you find out what you believe and what really counts. Change. Most of the changes I have made in my life resulted from thorough thinking on a subject. You can shape your thoughts almost anywhere. Just find a place that works for you, where you will be able to write things down, focus your attention without interruptions, and ask questions about your ideas. Find a place to stretch your thoughts. If you come upon great thoughts and spend time mentally shaping them, don't think you're done and can stop there. If you do, you will miss some of the most valuable aspects of the thinking process. You miss bringing others in and expanding ideas to their greatest potential. Earlier in my life, I have to admit, I was often guilty of this error. I wanted to take an idea from seed thought to solution before sharing it with anyone, even the people it would most impact. I did this both at work and at home. But over the years, I have learned that you can go much farther with a team than you can go alone. I've found a kind of formula that can help you stretch your thoughts. It says, the right thought plus the right people in the right environment at the right time for the right reason equals the right result. This combination is hard to beat. Like every person, every thought has the potential to become something great. When you find a place to stretch your thoughts, you find that potential. Find a place to land your thoughts. Author C.D. Jackson observes that great ideas need landing gear as well as wings. Any idea that remains only an idea doesn't make a great impact. The real power of an idea comes when it goes from abstraction to application. Think about Einstein's theory of relativity. When he published his theories in 1905 and 1916, they were merely profound ideas. The real power came with the development of the nuclear reactor in 1942 and the nuclear bomb in 1945. When scientists developed and implemented Einstein's ideas, the whole world changed. Likewise, if you want your thoughts to make an impact, you need to land them with others so that they can someday be implemented. As you plan for the application phase of the thinking process, land your ideas first with yourself. Landing an idea with yourself will give you integrity. People will buy into an idea only after they buy into the leader who communicates it. Before teaching any lesson, I ask myself three questions. Do I believe it? Do I live it? Do I believe others should live it? If I can't answer yes to all three questions, then I haven't landed it. Key players, let's face it, no idea will fly if the influencers don't embrace it. After all, they are the people who carry thoughts from idea to implementation. Those most affected, landing thoughts with the people on the firing line will give you great insight. Those closest to changes that occur as a result of a new idea can give you a reality read. And that's important, because sometimes even when you've diligently completed the process of creating a thought, shaping it, and stretching it with other good thinkers, you can still miss the mark. Find a place to fly your thoughts. French philosopher Henry Louis Bergson, who won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1927, asserted that a person should think like a man of action, act like a man of thought. What good does thinking if it has no application in real life? Thinking divorced from actions cannot be productive. Learning how to master the process of thinking well leads you to productive thinking. If you can develop the discipline of good thinking and turn it into a lifetime habit, then you will be successful and productive all of your life. Once you've created, shaped, stretched, and landed your thoughts, then flying them can be fun and easy. Portrait of a good thinker. You often hear someone say that a colleague or friend is a good thinker. But that phrase means something different to everyone. To one person it may mean having a high IQ, while to another it could mean knowing a bunch of trivia or being able to figure out who done it when reading a mystery novel. I believe that good thinking isn't just one thing. It consists of several specific thinking skills. Becoming a good thinker means developing those skills to the best of your ability. It doesn't matter whether you were born rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you have a third grade education or possess a Ph.D. It doesn't matter if you suffer from multiple disabilities or you're the picture of health. 
No matter what your circumstances, you can learn to be a good thinker. All you must do is be willing to engage in the process every day. In Built to Last, Jim Collins and Jerry Poros describe what it means to be a visionary company, the kind of company that epitomizes the pinnacle of American business. They describe those companies this way. 1. A visionary company is like a great work of art. Think of Michelangelo's scenes from Genesis on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel or his statue of David. Think of a great and enduring novel like Huckleberry Finn or Crime and Punishment. Think of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony or Shakespeare's Henry V. Think of a beautifully designed building, like the masterpieces of Frank Lloyd Wright or Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. You can't point to any one single item that makes the whole thing work. It's the entire work all the pieces working together to create an overall effect that leads to enduring greatness. Good thinking is similar. You need all the thinking pieces to become the kind of person who can achieve great things. Those pieces include the following 11 skills. Seeing the wisdom of big picture thinking Unleashing the potential of focused thinking Discovering the joy of creative thinking Recognizing the importance of realistic thinking Releasing the power of strategic thinking Feeling the energy of possibility thinking Embracing the lessons of reflective thinking Questioning the acceptance of popular thinking Encouraging the participation of shared thinking Experiencing the satisfaction of unselfish thinking Enjoying the return of bottom line thinking as you read the chapters dedicated to each kind of thinking, you will discover that they do not try to tell you what to think, they attempt to teach you how to think. As you become acquainted with each skill, you will find that some you do well, others you don't. Learn to develop each of those kinds of thinking, and you will become a better thinker. Master all that you can including the process of shared thinking which helps you compensate for your weak areas and your life will change. 1. Cultivate big picture thinking. Where success is concerned, people are not measured in inches, or pounds, or college degrees, or family background. They are measured by the size of their thinking. David Schwartz, big picture thinking can benefit any person in any profession. When somebody like Jack Welch tells a GE employee that the ongoing relationship with the customer is more important than the sale of an individual product, he's reminding them of the big picture. When two parents are fed up with potty training, poor grades, or fender benders, and one reminds the other that the current difficult time is only a temporary season, then they benefit from thinking big picture. Real estate developer Donald Trump quipped, You have to think anyway, so why not think big? Big picture thinking brings wholeness and maturity to a person's thinking. It brings perspective. It's like making the frame of a picture bigger, in the process expanding not only what you can see, but what you're able to do. Spend time with big picture thinkers, and you will find that they learn continually. Big picture thinkers are never satisfied with what they already know. They are always visiting new places, reading new books, meeting new people, learning new skills. And because of the practice, they often are able to connect the unconnected. They are lifelong learners. To help me maintain a learner's attitude, I spend a few moments every morning thinking about my learning opportunities for the day. As I review my calendar and to-do list knowing whom I will meet that day, what I will read, which meetings I will attend I note where I am most likely to learn something. Then I mentally cue myself to look attentively for something that will improve me in that situation. If you desire to keep learning, I want to encourage you to examine your day and look for opportunities to learn. Listen intentionally. An excellent way to broaden your experience is to listen to someone who has expertise in an area where you don't. I search for such opportunities. One year I spoke to about 900 coaches and scouts at the Senior Bowl, where graduating football players participate in their last college game. I had the opportunity, along with my son-in-law, Steve Miller, to have dinner with NFL head coaches Dave Wastet and Butch Davis. It's not often that you get such an opportunity, so I asked them questions about teamwork and spent a lot of time listening to them. At the end of the evening, as Steve and I were walking to our car, he said to me, John, I bet you asked those coaches a hundred questions tonight. If I'm going to learn and grow, I replied, I must know what questions to ask and know how to apply the answers to my life. Listening has taught me a lot more than talking. When you meet with people, it's good to have an agenda so that you can learn. 
it's a great way to partner with people who can do things you can't. Big picture thinkers recognize that they don't know lots of things. They frequently ask penetrating questions to enlarge their understanding and thinking. If you want to become a better big picture thinker, then become a good listener. Look expansively. Writer Henry David Thoreau wrote, Many an object is not seen, though it falls within the range of our visual ray, because it does not come within the range of our intellectual ray. Human beings habitually see their own world first. For example, when people arrive at a leadership conference put on by my company, they want to know where they are going to park, whether they will be able to get a good and comfortable seat, whether the speaker will be on, and if the brakes will be spaced right. When I arrive to speak at the same conference, I want to know that the lighting is good, the sound equipment is operating effectively, whether the speaker's platform will be close enough to the people, etc. Who year determines what you see and how you think. Big picture thinkers realize there is a world out there besides their own, and they make an effort to get outside of themselves and see other people's worlds through their eyes. It's hard to see the picture while inside the frame. To see how others see, you must first find out how they think. Becoming a good listener certainly helps with that. So does getting over your personal agenda and trying to take the other person's perspective. Life completely. French essayist Michel A. Kim de Montaigne wrote, The value of life lies not in the length of days, but in the use we make of them. A man may live long yet live very little. The truth is that you can spend your life any way you want, but you can spend it only once. Becoming a big picture thinker can help you to live with wholeness, to live a very fulfilling life. People who see the big picture expand their experience because they expand their world. As a result, they accomplish more than narrow-minded people. And they experience fewer unwanted surprises, too, because they are more likely to see the many components involved in any given situation, issues, people, relationships, timing, and values. They are also, therefore, usually more tolerant of other people in their thinking. W.H. Why you should receive the wisdom of big picture thinking intuitively, you probably recognize big picture thinking as beneficial. Few people want to be closed-minded. No one sets out to be that way. But just in case you're not completely convinced, consider several specific reasons why you should make the effort to become a better big picture thinker. Big picture thinking allows you to lead. You can find many big picture thinkers who aren't leaders but you will find few leaders who are not big picture thinkers. Leaders must be able to do many important things for their people. See the vision before their people do. The why also see more of it. This allows them to size up situations, taking into account many variables. Leaders who see the big picture discern possibilities as well as problems to form a foundation to build the vision. Once leaders have done that, they can sketch a picture of where the team is going including any potential challenges or obstacles. The goal of leaders shouldn't be merely to make their people feel good, but to help them be good and accomplish the dream. The vision, shown accurately, will allow leaders to show how the future connects with the past to make the journey more meaningful. When leaders recognize this need for connection and bridge it, then they can seize the moment when the timing is right. In leadership, when to move is as important as what you do. As Winston Churchill said, there comes a special moment in everyone's life, a moment for which that person was born. When he seizes it, it is his finest hour. Whether building roads, planning a trip, or moving in leadership, big picture thinking allows you to enjoy more success. People who are constantly looking at the whole picture have the best chance of succeeding in any endeavor. Big picture thinking keeps you on target. Thomas Fuller, chaplain to Charles II of England, observed. He that is everywhere is nowhere. To get things done, you need focus. However, to get the right things done, you also need to consider the big picture. Only by putting your daily activities in the context of the big picture will you be able to stay on target. As Alvin Toffler says, you've got to think about big things while you're doing small things, so that all the small things go in the right direction. Big picture thinking allows you to see what others see. One of the most important skills you can develop in human relations is the ability to see things from the other person's point of view. It's one of the keys to working with clients, satisfying customers, maintaining a marriage, reading children, 
helping those who are less fortunate, etc. All human interactions are enhanced by the ability to put yourself in another person's shoes. How? Look beyond yourself, your own interests, and your own world. When you work to consider an issue from every possible angle, examine it in the light of another's history, discover the interests and concerns of others, and try to set aside your own agenda, you begin to see what others see. And that is a powerful thing. Big picture thinking promotes teamwork. If you participate in any kind of team activity, then you know how important it is that team members see the whole picture, not just their own part. Any time a person doesn't know how his work fits with that of his teammates, then the whole team is in trouble. The better the grasp team members have of the big picture, the greater their potential to work together as a team. Big picture thinking keeps you from being caught up in the mundane let's face it, some aspects of everyday life are absolutely necessary but thoroughly uninteresting. Big picture thinkers don't let the grind get to them, because they don't lose sight of the all-important overview. They know that the person who forgets the ultimate is a slave to the immediate. Big picture thinking helps you to chart uncharted territory. Have you ever heard the expression, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it? That phrase undoubtedly was coined by someone who had trouble seeing the big picture. The world was built by people who crossed bridges in their minds long before anyone else did. The only way to break new ground or move into uncharted territory is to look beyond the immediate and see the big picture. HOW to acquire the wisdom of big picture thinking If you desire to seize new opportunities and open new reasons, then you need to add big picture thinking to your abilities. To become a good thinker better able to see the big picture, keep in mind the following suggestions. Don't strive for certainty. Big picture thinkers are comfortable with ambiguity. They don't try to force every observation or piece of data into pre-formulated mental cubby holes. They think broadly and can juggle many seemingly contradictory thoughts in their minds. If you want to cultivate the ability to think big picture, then you must get used to embracing and dealing with complex and diverse ideas. Learn from every experience. Big picture thinkers broaden their outlook by striving to learn from every experience. They don't rest on their successes, they learn from them. More importantly, they learn from their failures. They can do that because they remain teachable. Varied experiences both positive and negative help you see the big picture. The greater the variety of experience and success, the more potential to learn you have. If you desire to be a big picture thinker, then get out there and try a lot of things, take a lot of chances, and take time to learn after every victory or defeat. Gain insight from a variety of people. Big picture thinkers learn from their experiences, but they also learn from experiences they don't have. That is, they learn by receiving insight from others from customers, employees, colleagues, and leaders. If you desire to broaden your thinking and see more of the big picture, then seek out counselors to help you. But be wise in whom you ask for advice. Gaining insight from a variety of people doesn't mean stopping anyone and everyone in hallways and grocery store lines and asking what they think about a given subject. Be selective. Talk to people who know and care about you, who know their field, and who bring the experience deeper and broader than your own. Give yourself permission to expand your world. If you want to be a big picture thinker, you will have to go against the flow of the world. Society wants to keep people in boxes. Most people are married mentally to the status quo. They want what was, not what can be. They seek safety and simple answers. To think big picture, you need to give yourself permission to go a different way, to break new ground, to find new worlds to conquer. And when your world does get bigger, you need to celebrate. Never forget there is more out there in the world than what you've experienced. Keep learning, keep growing, and keep looking at the big picture. If you desire to be a good thinker, that's what you need to do. Think in question. Am I thinking beyond myself and my world so that I process ideas with a holistic perspective? 2. Engage in focused thinking. He did each thing as if he did nothing else. Spoken of novelist Charles Dickens. Philosopher Bertrand Russell once asserted, to be able to concentrate for a considerable time is essential to difficult achievement. Sociologist Robert Lind observed that knowledge is power only if a man knows what facts are not to bother about. 
Focused thinking removes distractions and mental clutter so that you can concentrate on an issue and think with clarity. Focused thinking can do several things for you. Focused thinking harnesses energy toward a desired goal. Focus can bring energy and power to almost anything, whether physical or mental. If you're learning how to pitch a baseball and you want to develop a good curveball, then focused thinking while practicing will improve your technique. If you need to refine the manufacturing process of your product, focused thinking will help you develop the best method. If you want to solve a difficult mathematics problem, focused thinking helps you break through to the solution. The greater the difficulty of the problem or issue, the more focused thinking time is necessary to solve it. Focused thinking gives ideas time to develop. I love to discover and develop ideas. I often bring my creative team together for brainstorming and creative thinking. When we first get together, we try to be exhaustive in our thinking in order to generate as many ideas as possible. The birthing of a potential breakthrough often results from sharing many good ideas. But to take ideas to the next level, you must shift from being expansive in your thinking to being selective. I have discovered that a good idea can become a great idea when it is given focused time. It's true that focusing on a single idea for a long time can be very frustrating. I've often spent days focusing on a thought and trying to develop it, only to find that I could not improve the idea. But sometimes my perseverance and focused thinking pays off. That brings me great joy. And when focused thinking is at its best, not only does the idea grow, but so do I. Focused thinking brings clarity to the target. I consider golf one of my favorite hobbies. It's a wonderfully challenging game. I like it because the objectives are so clear. Professor William Mobley of the University of South Carolina made the following observation about golf. One of the most important things about golf is the presence of clear goals. You see the pins. You know the parts neither too easy nor unattainable. You know your average score. And there are competitive goals competitive with par, with yourself and others. These goals give you something to shoot at. In work, as in golf, goals motivate. One time on the golf course, I followed a golfer who neglected to put the pin back in the hole after he putted. Because I could not see my target, I couldn't focus properly. My focus quickly turned to frustration and to poor play. To be a good golfer, a person needs to focus on a clear target. The same is true in thinking. Focus helps you to know the goal and to achieve it. Focused thinking will take you to the next level. No one achieves greatness by becoming a generalist. You don't hone a skill by diluting your attention to its development. The only way to get to the next level is to focus. No matter whether your goal is to increase your level of play, sharpen your business plan, improve your bottom line, develop your subordinates, or solve personal problems, you need to focus. Author Harry A. Overstreet observed, The immature mind hops from one thing to another. The mature mind seeks to follow through. Where should you focus your thinking? Does every area of your life deserve dedicated, focused thinking time? Of course, the answer is no. Be selective, not exhaustive, in your focused thinking. For me, that means dedicating in-depth thinking time to four areas. Leadership, creativity, communication, and intentional networking. Your choices will probably differ from mine. Here are a few suggestions to help you figure them out. Identify your priorities. First, take into account your priorities for yourself, your family, and your team. Author, consultant, and award-winning thinker Edward de Bono quipped, a conclusion is the place where you get tired of thinking. Unfortunately, many people land on priorities based on where they run out of steam. You certainly don't want to do that nor do you want to let others set your agenda. There are many ways to determine priorities. If you know yourself well, begin by focusing on your strengths, the things that make best use of your skills and God-given talents. You might also focus on what brings the highest return and reward. Do what you enjoy most and do best. You could use the 80 over 20 rule. Give 80% of your effort to the top 20%. Most important, activities. Another way is to focus on exceptional opportunities that promise a huge return. It comes down to this. Give your attention to the areas that bear fruit. Discover your gifts. Not all people are self-aware and have a good handle on their own skills, gifts, and talents. 
They are a little like the comic strip character Charlie Brown. One day after striking out in a baseball game, he says, Rats. I'll never be a big league player. I just don't have it. All my life I've dreamed of playing in the big leagues, but I'll never make it. To which Lucy replies, Charlie Brown, you're thinking too far ahead. What you need to do is set more immediate goals for yourself. For a moment, Charlie Brown sees a ray of hope. Immediate goals. He says, yes, answers Lucy. Start with the next inning. When you go out to pitch, see if you can walk out to the mound without falling down. I've met many individuals who grew up in a household full of Lucy's. They received little encouragement or affirmation, and as a result seem at a loss for direction. If you have that kind of background, you need to work extra hard to figure out what your gifts are. Take a personality profile such as DISC or Myers-Briggs. Interview positive friends and family members to see where they think you shine. Spend some time reflecting on past successes. If you're going to focus your thinking in your areas of strength, you need to know what they are. Develop your dream. If you want to achieve great things, you need to have a great dream. If you're not sure of your dream, use your focused thinking time to help you discover it. If your thinking has returned to a particular area time after time, you may be able to discover your dream there. Give it more focus time and see what happens. Once you find your dream, move forward without second guessing. Take the advice of Satchel Page. Don't look back something might be gaining on you. The younger you are, the more likely you will give your attention to many things. That's good because if you're young you're still getting to know yourself, your strengths and weaknesses. If you focus your thinking on only one thing and your aspirations change, then you've wasted your best mental energy. As you get older and more experienced, the need to focus becomes more critical. The farther and higher you go, the more focused you can be and need to be. How can you stay focused? Once you have a handle on what you should think about, you must decide how to better focus on it. Here are five suggestions to help you with the process. Remove distractions. Removing distractions is no small matter in our current culture, but it's critical. How do you do it? First, by maintaining the discipline of practicing your priorities. Don't do easy things first or hard things first or urgent things first. Do first things first the activities that give you the highest return. In that way, you keep the distractions to a minimum. Second, insulate yourself from distractions. I've found that I need blocks of time to think without interruptions. I've mastered the art of making myself unavailable when necessary and going after my thinking place so that I can work without interruptions. Because of my responsibilities as founder of three companies, however, I am always aware of the tension between my need to remain accessible to others as a leader and my need to withdraw from them to think. The best way to resolve the tension is to understand the value of both activities. Walking slowly through the crowd allows me to connect with people and know their needs. Withdrawing from the crowd allows me to think of ways to add value to them. My advice to you is to place value on and give attention to both. If you naturally withdraw, then make sure to get out among people more often. If you're always on the go and rarely withdraw for thinking time, then remove yourself periodically so that you can unleash the potential of focused thinking. And wherever you are, be there. Make time for focused thinking. Once you have a place to think, you need the time to think. Because of the fast pace of our culture, people tend to multitask. But that's not always a good idea. Switching from task to task can cost you up to 40% efficiency. According to researchers, if you're trying to accomplish many things at the same time, you'll get more done by focusing on one task at a time, not by switching constantly from one task to another. 2. Years ago I realized that my best thinking time occurs in the morning. Whenever possible, I reserve my mornings for thinking and writing. One way to gain time for focused thinking is to impose upon yourself a rule that one company implemented. Don't allow yourself to look at email until after 10 a.m. Instead, focus your energies on your number one priority. Put non-productive time wasters on hold so that you can create thinking time for yourself. Keep items of focus before you. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great transcendental thinker, believed, concentration is the secret of strength in politics, in war, in trade, 
in short, in all management of human affairs. To help me concentrate on the things that matter, I work to keep important items before me. One way is to ask my assistant, Linda Eggers, to keep bringing it up, asking me about it, giving me additional information in reference to it. I'll also keep a file or a page on my desk so that I see it every day as I work. That strategy has successfully helped me for 30 years to stimulate and sharpen ideas. If you've never done it, I recommend that you try it. I'll tell you more about it in the section on reflective thinking. Set goals. I believe goals are important. The mind will not focus until it has clear objectives. But the purpose of goals is to focus your attention and give you direction, not to identify a final destination. As you think about your goals, note that they should be clear enough to be kept in focus close enough to be achieved helpful enough to change lives. Those guidelines will get you going. And be sure to write down your goals. If they are not written, I can almost guarantee that they are not focused enough. And if you really want to make sure they are focused, take the advice of David Belasco, who says, If you can't write your idea on the back of my business card, you don't have a clear idea. Even if you look back years from now and think your goals were too small, they will have served their purpose if they provide you with direction. Question your progress. Take a good look at yourself from time to time to see whether you're actually making progress. That is the most accurate measure of whether you're making the best use of focused thinking. Ask yourself, am I seeing a return for my investment of focused thinking time? Is what I'm doing getting me closer to my goals? Am I headed in a direction that helps me to fulfill my commitments, maintain my priorities, and realize my dreams? WHA are you giving up to go up? No one can go to the highest level and remain a generalist. My dad used to say, find the one thing you do well and don't do anything else. I've found that to do well at a few things, I have had to give up many things. As I worked on this chapter, I spent some time reflecting on the kinds of things I've given up. Here are the main ones. I can't know everyone. I love people, and I'm outgoing. Put me into a room full of people, and I feel energized. So it goes against my grain to restrict myself from spending time with lots of people. To compensate for that, I've done a couple of things. First, I've chosen a strong inner circle of people. They not only provide tremendous professional help, but they also make life's journey much more pleasant. Second, I ask certain friends to catch me up on what's happening in the lives of other friends. I usually do that when I'm traveling and can't block out the time I would need for focused thinking. I can't do everything. There are only a few exceptional opportunities in any person's lifetime. That's why I strive for excellence in a few things rather than a good performance in many. That's cost me. Because of my workload, I also have to skip doing many things that I would love to do. For example, every week I hand off projects that I think would be fun to do myself. I practice the 10 to 80 minus 10 principle with the people to whom I'm delegating a task. I help with the first 10% by casting vision, laying down parameters, providing resources, and giving encouragement. Then once they've done the middle 80%, I come alongside them again and help them take whatever it is the rest of the way, if I can. I call it putting the cherry on top. I can't go everywhere. Every conference speaker and author has to travel a lot. Before I began doing much speaking, that seemed like a glamorous life. But after logging several million miles, I know what kind of a toll it can take. Ironically, I still love traveling for pleasure with my wife, Margaret. It's one of her great joys. She and I could take 10 vacations a year and enjoy every one of them. Yet we can't, because so much of my time is consumed doing what I was called to do. Help people to grow personally and to develop as leaders. I can't be well-rounded. Being focused also keeps me from being well-rounded. I tell people, 99% of everything in life I don't need to know about. I try to focus on the 1% that gives the highest return. And of the remaining 99, Margaret keeps me aware of whatever I need to know. It's one of the ways I keep from getting totally out of balance in my life. Being willing to give up some of the things you love in order to focus on what has the greatest impact isn't an easy lesson to learn. But the earlier you embrace it, the sooner you can dedicate yourself to excellence in what matters most. Thinking question. 
Am I dedicated to removing distractions and mental clutter so that I can concentrate with clarity on the real issue? 3. Harness creative thinking. The joy is in creating, not maintaining. Vince Lombardi, NFL Hall of Fame coach. Creativity is pure gold, no matter what you do for a living. Annette Moser Wellman, author of The Five Faces of Genius, asserts, The most valuable resource you bring to your work and to your firm is your creativity. More than what you get done, more than the role you play, more than your title, more than your output, it's your ideas that matter. 3. Despite the importance of a person's ability to think with creativity, few people seem to possess the skill in abundance. If you're not as creative as you would like to be, you can change your way of thinking. Creative thinking isn't necessarily original thinking. In fact, I think people mythologize original thought. Most often, creative thinking is a composite of other thoughts discovered along the way. Even the great artists, whom we consider highly original, learned from their masters, modeled their work on that of others, and brought together a host of ideas and styles to create their own work. Study art, and you will see threads that run through the work of all artists and artistic movements, connecting them to other artists who went before them. Characteristics of creative thinkers. Perhaps you're not even sure what I mean when I ask whether you're a creative thinker. Consider some characteristics that creative thinkers have in common. Creative thinkers value ideas. Annette Moser Wellman observes, highly creative people are dedicated to ideas. They don't rely on their talent alone. They rely on their discipline. Their imagination is like a second skin. They know how to manipulate it to its fullest. For creativity is about having ideas lots of them. You will have ideas only if you value ideas. Creative thinkers explore options. I've yet to meet a creative thinker who didn't love options. Exploring a multitude of possibilities helps to stimulate the imagination, and imagination is crucial to creativity. As Albert Einstein put it, imagination is more important than knowledge. People who know me well will tell you that I place a very high value on options. Why? Because they provide the key to finding the best answer not the only answer. Good thinkers come up with the best answers. They create backup plans that provide them with alternatives. They enjoy freedom that others do not possess. And they will influence and lead others. Creative thinkers embrace ambiguity. Writer H. L. Mencken said, It is the dull man who is always sure, and the sure man who is always dull. Creative people don't feel the need to stamp out uncertainty. They see all kinds of inconsistencies and gaps in life, and they often take delight in exploring those gaps or in using their imagination to fill them in. Creative thinkers celebrate the offbeat. Creativity, by its very nature, often explores off of the beaten path and goes against the grain. Diplomat and Longtime president of Yale University Kingman Brewster said, There is a correlation between the creative and the screwball. So we must suffer the screwball gladly. To foster creativity in yourself or others, be willing to tolerate a little oddness. Creative thinkers connect the unconnected. Because creativity utilizes the ideas of others, there's great value in being able to connect one idea to another especially to seemingly unrelated ideas. Graphic designer Tim Hansen says, Creativity is especially expressed in the ability to make connections, to make associations, to turn things around and express them in a new way. Creating additional thoughts is like taking a trip in your car. You may know where you're going, but only as you move toward your destination can you see and experience things in a way not possible before you started. Creative thinking works something like this. Think, collect, create, correct, connect. Once you begin to think, you're free to collect. You ask yourself, what material relates to this thought? Once you have the material, you ask, what ideas can make the thought better? That can start to take an idea to the next level. After that, you can correct or refine it by asking, what changes can make these ideas better? Finally, you connect the ideas by positioning them in the right context to make the thought complete and powerful. Creative thinkers don't fear failure. Creativity demands the ability to be unafraid of failure because creativity equals failure. You may be surprised to hear such a statement, but it's true. Charles Frankel asserts that anxiety is the essential condition of intellectual and artistic creation. Creativity requires a willingness to look stupid. 
It means getting out on a limb knowing that the limb often breaks. Creative people know these things and still keep searching for new ideas. They just don't let the ideas that don't work prevent them from coming up with more ideas that do work. WHY you should discover the joy of creative thinking. Creativity can improve a person's quality of life. Here are five specific things creative thinking has the potential to do for you. Creative thinking adds value to everything. Wouldn't you enjoy a limitless reservoir of ideas that you could draw upon at any time? That's what creative thinking gives you. For that reason, no matter what you are currently able to do, creativity can increase your capabilities. Creativity is being able to see what everybody else has seen and think what nobody else has thought so that you can do what nobody else has done. Sometimes creative thinking lies along the lines of invention, where you break new ground. Other times it moves along the lines of innovation, which helps you to do old things in a new way. But either way, it's seeing the world through sufficiently new eyes so that new solutions appear. That always adds value. Creative thinking compounds. Over the years, I've found that creative thinking is hard work but creative thinking compounds given enough time and focus. Perhaps more than any other kind of thinking, creative thinking builds on itself and increases the creativity of the thinker. Poet Maya Angelou observed, you can't use up creativity. The more you use, the more you have. Sadly, too often creativity is smothered rather than nurtured. There has to be a climate in which new ways of thinking, perceiving, questioning are encouraged. If you cultivate creative thinking in an environment that nurtures creativity, there's no telling what kind of ideas you can come up with. I'll talk more on that later. Creative thinking draws people to you and your ideas. Creativity is intelligence having fun. People admire intelligence, and they're always attracted to fun so the combination is fantastic. If anyone could be said to have fun with his intelligence, it was Leonardo da Vinci. The diversity of his ideas and expertise staggers the mind. He was a painter, architect, sculptor, anatomist, musician, inventor, and engineer. The term Renaissance man was coined because of him. Just as people were drawn to da Vinci and his ideas during their renaissance, they are drawn to creative people today. If you cultivate creativity, you will become more attractive to other people, and they will be drawn to you. Creative thinking helps you learn more. Author and creativity expert Ernie Zielinski says, Creativity is the joy of not knowing at all. The joy of not knowing at all refers to the realization that we seldom if ever have all the answers. We always have the ability to generate more solutions to just about any problem. Being creative is being able to see or imagine a great deal of opportunity to life's problems. Creativity is having options. 5. It almost seems too obvious to say, but if you're always actively seeking new ideas, you will learn. Creativity is teachability. It's seeing more solutions than problems. And the greater the quantity of thoughts, the greater the chance for learning something new. Creative thinking challenges the status quo. If you desire to improve your world or even your own situation then creativity will help you. The status quo and creativity are incompatible. Creativity and innovation always walk hand in hand. HOW to discover the joy of creative thinking. At this point you may be saying, okay, I'm convinced that creative thinking is important. But how do I find the creativity within me? How do I discover the joy of creative thought? Here are five ways to do it. Remove creativity killers. Economics professor and humor author Stephen Leacock said, Personally, I would sooner have written Alice in Wonderland than the whole Encyclopedia Britannica. He valued the warmth of creativity over cold facts. If you do too, then you need to eliminate attitudes that devalue creative thinking. Take a look at the following phrases. They are almost guaranteed to kill creative thinking any time you hear or think them. I'm not a creative person follow the rules. Don't ask questions don't be different stay within the lines there is only one way don't be foolish be practical. Be serious. Think of your image that's not logical it's not practical it's never been done it can't be done. It didn't work for them we tried that before it's too much work we can't afford to make a mistake it will be too hard to administer we don't have the time we don't have the money yes. But play is frivolous failure is final. If you think you have a great idea, don't let anyone talk you out of it even if it sounds foolish. 
Don't let yourself or anyone else subject you to creativity killers. After all, you can't do something new and exciting if you force yourself to stay in the same old rut. Don't just work harder at the same old thing. Make a change. Think creatively by asking the right questions. Creativity is largely a matter of asking the right questions. Management trainer Sir Anthony J said, The uncreative mind can spot wrong answers, but it takes a creative mind to spot wrong questions. Wrong questions shut down the process of creative thinking. They direct thinkers down the same old path, or they chide them into believing that thinking isn't necessary at all. To stimulate creative thinking, ask yourself questions such as, Why must it be done this way? What is the root problem? What are the underlying issues? What does this remind me of? What is the opposite? What metaphor or symbol helps to explain it? Why is it important? What's the hardest or most expensive way to do it? Who has a different perspective on this? What happens if we don't do it at all? You get the idea and you can probably come up with better questions yourself. Physicist Tom Herskfield observed, If you don't ask, why this? Often enough, somebody will ask, why you? If you want to think creatively, you must ask good questions. You must challenge the process. Develop a creative environment. Charlie Brower said, A new idea is delicate. It can be killed by a sneer or a yawn. It can be stabbed to death by a quip and worried to death by a frown on the right man's brow. Negative environments school thousands of great ideas every minute. A creative environment, on the other hand, becomes like a greenhouse where ideas get seeded, spread up, and flourish. A creative environment encourages creativity. David Hill says, Studies of creativity suggest that the biggest single variable of whether or not employees will be creative is whether they perceive they have permission. When innovation and good thinking are openly encouraged and rewarded, then people see that they have permission to be creative. Places a high value on trust among team members and individuality. Creativity always risks failure. That's why trust is so important to creative people. In the creative process, trust comes from people working together. From knowing that people on the team have experienced launching successful, creative ideas, and from the assurance that creative ideas won't go to waste, because they will be implemented. Embraces those who are creative. Creative people celebrate the offbeat. How should creative people be treated? I take the advice of Tom Peters. We doubt the dullards nurture the nuts. I do that by spending time with them, which I enjoy anyway. I especially like to pull people into brainstorming sessions. People look forward to an invitation to such meetings because the time will be filled with energy, ideas, and laughter. And the odds are high that a new project, seminar, or business strategy will result. When that happens, they also know a party's coming. Focuses on innovation, not just invention. Sam Weston, creator of the popular action figure G.I. Joe, said. Truly groundbreaking ideas are rare, but you don't necessarily need one to make a career out of creativity. My definition of creativity is the logical combination of two or more existing elements that result in a new concept. The best way to make a living with your imagination is to develop innovative applications, not imagine completely new concepts. Creative people say, give me a good idea and I'll give you a better idea. Is willing to let people go outside the lines. Most people automatically stay within lines, even if those lines have been arbitrarily drawn or are terribly out of date. Remember, most limitations we face are not imposed on us by others. We place them on ourselves. Lack of creativity often falls into that category. If you want to be more creative, challenge boundaries. Inventor Charles Kittering said, All human development, no matter what form it takes, must be outside the rules, otherwise we would never have anything new. A creative environment takes that into account. Appreciates the power of a dream. A creative environment promotes the freedom of a dream. A creative environment encourages the use of a blank sheet of paper and the question, if we could draw a picture of what we want to accomplish, what would it look like? A creative environment allowed Martin Luther King, Jr., to speak with passion and declare to millions, I have a dream, not I have a goal. Goals may give focus, but dreams give power. Dreams expand the world. That is why James Allen suggested that dreamers are the saviors of the world. 
The more creativity friendly you can make your environment, the more potential it has to become creative. Spend time with other creative people. What if the place you work has an environment hostile to creativity, and you possess little ability to change it? One possibility is to change jobs. But what if you desire to keep working there despite the negative environment? Your best option is to find a way to spend time with other creative people. Creativity is contagious. Have you ever noticed what happens during a good brainstorming session? One person throws out an idea. Another person uses it as a springboard to discover another idea. Someone else takes it in yet another, even better direction. Then somebody grabs hold of it and takes it to a whole new level. The interplay of ideas can be electric. I have a strong group of creative individuals in my life. I make sure to spend regular time with them. When I leave them, I always feel energized. I'm full of ideas, and I see things differently. They truly are indispensable to my life. It's a fact that you begin to think like the people you spend a lot of time with. The more time you can spend with creative people engaging in creative activities, the more creative you will become. Get out of your box. Actress Catherine Hepburn remarked, If you obey all the rules, you will miss all the fun. Well I don't think it's necessary to break all the rules, many are in place to protect us. I do think it's unwise to allow self-imposed limitations to hinder us. Creative thinkers know that they must repeatedly break out of the box of their own history and personal limitations in order to experience creative breakthroughs. The most effective way to help yourself get out of the box is to expose yourself to new paradigms. One way you can do that is by traveling to new places. Explore other cultures, countries, and traditions. Find out how people very different from you live and think. Another is to read on new subjects. I'm naturally curious and love to learn, but I still have a tendency to read books only on my favorite subjects, such as leadership. I sometimes have to force myself to read books that broaden my thinking, because I know it's worth it. If you want to break out of your own box, get into somebody else's. Read broadly. Many people mistakenly believe that if individuals aren't born with creativity, they will never be creative. But you can see from the many strategies and examples I've given that creativity can be cultivated in the right supportive environment. Think and question. Am I working to break out of my box of limitations so that I explore ideas and options to experience creative breakthroughs? 4. Employ realistic thinking. The first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. M. A. X. Dupree, Chairman Emeritus of Herman Miller, Inc. As anyone knows who's been out of school for a few years, there's usually a huge gap between a college education and the reality of the working world. Honestly, early in my career, I went out of my way to avoid too much realistic thinking because I thought it would interfere with my creative thinking. But as I've grown, I've come to realize that realistic thinking adds to my life. Reality check. Reality is the difference between what we wish for and what is. It took some time for me to evolve into a realistic thinker. The process went in phases. First, I did not engage in realistic thinking at all. After a while, I realized that it was necessary, so I began to engage in it occasionally. But I didn't like it because I thought it was too negative. And any time I could delegate it, I did. Eventually, I found that I had to engage in realistic thinking if I was going to solve problems and learn from my mistakes. And in time, I became willing to think realistically before I got in trouble and make it a continual part of my life. Today, I encourage my key leaders to think realistically. We make realistic thinking the foundation of our business because we derive certainty and security from it. Why you should recognize the importance of realistic thinking if you're a naturally optimistic person, as I am, you may not possess great desire to become a more realistic thinker. But cultivating the ability to be realistic in your thinking will not undermine your faith in people, nor will it lessen your ability to see and seize opportunities. Instead, it will add value to you in other ways. Realistic thinking minimizes downside risk. Actions always have consequences. Realistic thinking helps you to determine what those consequences could be. And that's crucial, because only by recognizing and considering consequences can you plan for them. If you plan for the worst-case scenario, you can minimize the downside risk. 
Realistic thinking gives you a target and game plan. I've known business people who were not realistic thinkers. Here's the good news. They were very positive and had a high degree of hope for their business. Here's the bad news. Hope is not a strategy. Realistic thinking leads to excellence in leadership and management because it requires people to face reality. They begin to define their target and develop a game plan to hit it. When people engage in realistic thinking, they also begin to simplify practices and procedures, which results in better efficiency. Truthfully, in business only a few decisions are important. Realistic thinkers understand the difference between the important decisions and those that are merely necessary in the normal course of business. The decisions that matter relate directly to your purpose. James Allen was right when he wrote, Until thought is linked with purpose there is no intelligent accomplishment. 6. Realistic thinking is a catalyst for change. People who rely on hope for their success rarely make change a high priority. If you have only hope, imply that achievement and success are out of your hands. It's a matter of luck or chance. Why bother changing? Realistic thinking can spell that kind of wrong attitude. There's nothing like staring reality in the face to make a person recognize the need for change. Change alone doesn't bring growth but you cannot have growth without change. Realistic thinking provides security. Anytime you have thought through the worst that can happen and you have developed contingency plans to meet it, you become more confident and secure. It's reassuring to know that you are unlikely to be surprised. Disappointment is the difference between expectations and reality. Realistic thinking minimizes the difference between the two. Realistic thinking gives you credibility. Realistic thinking helps people to buy into the leader and his or her vision. Leaders continually surprised by the unexpected soon lose credibility with their followers. On the other hand, Leaders who think realistically and plan accordingly position their organizations to win. That gives their people confidence in them. The best leaders ask realistic questions before casting vision. They ask themselves things like, Is it possible? Does this dream include everyone or just a few? Have I identified and articulated the areas that will make this dream difficult to achieve? Realistic thinking provides a foundation to build on Thomas Edison observed. The value of a good idea is in using it. The bottom line on realistic thinking is that it helps you to make an idea usable by taking away the wish factor. Most ideas and efforts don't accomplish their intended results because they rely too much on what we wish rather than what is. You can't build a house in midair. It needs a solid foundation. Ideas and plans are the same. They need something concrete on which to build. Realistic thinking provides the solid foundation. Realistic thinking is a friend to those in trouble if creativity is what you would do if you were unafraid of the possibility of failure, then reality is dealing with failure if it does happen. Realistic thinking gives you something concrete to fall back on during times of trouble, which can be very reassuring. Certainty in the midst of uncertainty brings stability. Realistic thinking brings the dream to fruition British novelist John Giles where they wrote, Idealism increases in direct proportion to one's distance from the problem. If you don't get close enough to a problem, you can't tackle it. If you don't take a realistic look at your dream and what it will take to accomplish it you will never achieve it. Realistic thinking helps to pave the way for bringing any dream to fruition. HOW to recognize the importance of realistic thinking because I'm naturally optimistic rather than realistic. I've had to take concrete steps to improve my thinking in this area. Here are five things I do to improve my realistic thinking. Develop an appreciation for truth. I could not develop as a realistic thinker until I gain an appreciation for realistic thinking. And that means learning to look at and enjoy truth. President Harry S. Truman said, I never give em hell. I just tell the truth and they think it is hell. That's the way many people react to truth. People tend to exaggerate their success and minimize their failures or deficiencies. They live according to Rockert's law, believing there is nothing so small that it can't be blown out of proportion. Unfortunately, many people today could be described by a quote from Winston Churchill. Men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing has happened. More recently, television journalist Ted Koppel observed, Our society finds truth too strong a medicine to digest and diluted. In its purest form, truth is not a polite tap on the shoulder.
it is a howling reproach. In other words, the truth will set you free but first it will make you angry. If you want to become a realistic thinker, however, you need to get comfortable dealing with the truth and face up to it. Do your homework. The process of realistic thinking begins with doing your homework. You must first get the facts. Former Governor, Congressman, and Ambassador Chester Bowles said, When you approach a problem, strip yourself of preconceived opinions and prejudice, assemble and learn the facts of the situation, make the decision which seems to you to be the most honest, and then stick to it. It doesn't matter how sound your thinking is if it's based on faulty data or assumptions. You can't think well in the absence of facts, or in the presence of poor information. You can also find out what others have done in similar circumstances. Remember, your thinking doesn't necessarily have to be original. It just has to be solid. Why not learn all that you can from good thinkers who have faced similar situations in the past? Some of my best thinking has been done by others. Think through the pros and cons. There's nothing like taking the time to really examine the pros and cons of an issue to give you a strong dose of reality. It rarely comes down to simply choosing the course of action with the greatest number of pros, because all pros and cons do not carry equal weight. But that's not the value of the exercise. Anyway, rather, it helps you to dig into the facts, examine an issue from many angles, and really count the cost of a possible course of action. Picture the worst case scenario. The essence of realistic thinking is discovering, picturing, and examining the worst case scenario. Ask yourself questions such as, what if sales fall short of projections? What if revenue hits rock bottom? Not an optimist rock bottom, but real rock bottom. What if we don't win the account? What if the client doesn't pay us? What if we have to do the job short-handed? What if our best player gets sick? What if all the colleges reject my application? What if the market goes belly up? What if the volunteers quit? What if nobody shows up? You get the idea. The point is that you need to think about worst case possibilities whether you're running a business, leading a department, pastoring a church, coaching a team, or planning your personal finances. Your goal isn't to be negative or to expect the worst, just to be ready for it in case it happens. That way, you give yourself the best chance for a positive result no matter what. If you picture the worst case and examine it honestly, then you really have experienced a reality check. You're ready for anything. As you do that, take the advice of Charles Hole, who advised, deliberate with caution, but act with decision, and yield with graciousness or oppose with firmness. Align your thinking with your resources. One of the keys to maximizing realistic thinking is aligning your resources with your objectives. Looking at pros and cons and examining worst-case scenarios will make you aware of any gaps between what you desire and what really is. Once you know what those gaps are, you can use your resources to fill them. After all, that's what resources are for. Super Bowl, Super Dome, Super Security. Our country received lessons in realistic thinking following the tragedy of September the 11th. 2001. The destruction of the World Trade Center buildings in New York City far surpassed any worst-case scenarios that anyone might have envisioned. In the wake of that event, we now find that we don't have the luxury of avoiding or neglecting realistic thinking. I was reminded of that on Sunday, February the 3rd, 2002, when I attended the Super Bowl in New Orleans, Louisiana. I had been to the big game twice before to root for the home team first San Diego and later Atlanta and had seen both teams lose. But I had never been to a game like this. The occasion had been designated a national security special event. That meant that the US Secret Service would be overseeing it. Military personnel would work with local law enforcement, and security would be of the highest caliber. The Secret Service brought in several hundred agents and secured the area. In preparation for the game, Access to the Superdome was highly restricted, with intensified screening. Officials blocked off roads, closed the nearby interstate, and designated the area an all-fly zone. We arrived early at the Dome officials suggested fans arrive up to five hours ahead of game time and we immediately saw evidence of the precautionary measures. Eight-foot fences surrounded the whole area, and concrete barriers prevented unauthorized vehicles from getting close to the building. We could see sharpshooters positioned at various locations, 
including on the roof of some adjacent buildings. When we reached the gate, police officers and security personnel patted us down and examined everyone's belongings. After that they directed us to go through metal detectors. Only then did they allow us into the stadium. That's all well and good, you may be saying, but what would have happened had there been a terrorist attack? The Secret Service had that covered too, because they had prepared for the worst case scenario. Evacuation plans had been put into place, and personnel at the Superdome had been drilled to make sure everyone knew what to do in case of an emergency. New Orleans Mayor Mark Morial said the day before the Super Bowl, We want to send a message to all visitors that New Orleans is going to be the safest place in America. 7 We got the message. We didn't feel the least bit worried. That's what happens when leaders recognize the importance of realistic thinking. Thinking question. Am I building a solid mental foundation on facts so that I can think with certainty? 5. Utilize strategic thinking. Most people spend more time planning their summer vacation than planning their lives. Source unknown. When you hear the words strategic thinking, what comes to mind? Do visions of business plans dance in your head? Do you conjure up marketing plans, the kind that can turn a company around? Perhaps you contemplate global politics. Or you recall some of history's greatest military campaigns. Hannibal crossing the Alps to surprise the Roman army, Charlemagne's conquest of Western Europe, or the Allies' D-Day invasion of Normandy. Perhaps, but strategy doesn't have to be restricted to military action or even to business. Strategic thinking can make a positive impact on any area of life. PLAN your life, live your plan. I've observed that most people try to plan their lives one day at a time. They wake up, make up their to-do list, and dive into action, although some people aren't even that strategic. Fewer individuals plan their lives one week at a time. They review their calendar for the week, check their appointments, review their goals, and then get to work. They generally out-achieve most of their daily planning colleagues. I try to take planning one step further. At the beginning of every month, I spend half a day working on my calendar for the next 40 days. 40 days works for me rather than just 30. That way, I get a jump on the next month and don't get surprised. I begin by reviewing my travel schedule and planning activities with my family. Then I review what projects, lessons, and other objectives I want to accomplish during those five to six weeks. Then I start blocking out days and times for thinking, writing, working, meeting with people, etc. I set times to do fun things, such as seeing a show, watching a ball game, or playing golf. I also set aside small blocks of time to compensate for the unexpected. By the time I'm done, I can tell you nearly everything I'll be doing, almost hour by hour during the coming weeks. This strategy is one of the reasons I have been able to accomplish much. WHY you should release the power of strategic thinking. Strategic thinking helps me to plan, to become more efficient, to maximize my strengths, and to find the most direct path toward achieving any objective. The benefits of strategic thinking are numerous. Here are a few of the reasons you should adopt it as one of your thinking tools. Strategic thinking simplifies the difficult. Strategic thinking is really nothing more than planning on steroids. Spanish novelist Miguel de Cervantes said, The man who is prepared has his battle half fought. Strategic thinking takes complex issues and long-term objectives, which can be very difficult to address, and breaks them down into manageable sizes. Anything becomes simpler when it has a plan. Strategic thinking can also help you simplify the management of everyday life. I do that by using systems which are nothing more than good strategies repeated. I am well known among pastors and other speakers for my filing system. Writing a lesson or speech can be difficult. But because I use my system to file quotes, stories, and articles, when I need something to flesh out or illustrate a point, I simply go to one of my 1,200 files and find a good piece of material that works. Just about any difficult task can be made simpler with strategic thinking. Strategic thinking prompts you to ask the right questions. Do you want to break down complex or difficult issues? Then ask questions. Strategic thinking forces you, through this process, take a look at the following questions developed by my friend Bob Beale, the author of Master Planning. 8. Direction. 
What should we do next? Why? Organization. Who is responsible for what? Who is responsible for whom? Do we have the right people in the right places? Cash. What is our projected income? Expense. Net. Can we afford it? How can we afford it? Tracking. Are we on target? Overall evaluation. Are we achieving the quality we expect and demand of ourselves? Refinement. How can we be more effective and more efficient? Move toward the ideal. These may not be the only questions you need to ask to begin formulating a strategic plan, but they are certainly a good start. Strategic thinking prompts customization. General George S. Patton observed, Successful generals make plans to fit circumstances, but do not try to create circumstances to fit plans. All good strategic thinkers are precise in their thinking. They try to match the strategy to the problem, because strategy isn't a one-size-fits-all proposition. Sloppy or generalized thinking is an enemy of achievement. The intention to customize and strategic thinking forces a person to go beyond vague ideas and engage in specific ways to go after a task or problem. It sharpens the mind. Strategic thinking prepares you today for an uncertain tomorrow. Strategic thinking is the bridge that links where you are to where you want to be. It gives direction and credibility today and increases your potential for success tomorrow. It is, as Mary Webb suggests, like saddling your dreams before you ride them. Strategic thinking reduces the margin of error any time you shoot from the hip or go into a totally reactive mode. You increase your margin for error. It's like a golfer stepping up to a golf ball and hitting it before lining up the shot. Misaligning a shot by just a few degrees can send the ball a hundred yards off target. Strategic thinking, however, greatly reduces that margin for error. It lines up your actions with your objectives, just as lining up a shot in golf helps you to put the ball closer to the pin. The better aligned you are with your target, the better the odds that you will be going in the right direction. Strategic thinking gives you influence with others one executive confided in another. Our company has a short-range plan and a long-range plan. Our short-range plan is to stay afloat long enough to make it to a long-range plan. That's hardly a strategy, yet that's the position where some business leaders put themselves. There's more than one problem with neglecting strategic thinking in that way. Not only does it fail to build the business, but it also loses the respect of everyone involved with the business. The one with the plan is the one with the power. It doesn't matter in what kind of activity you're involved. Employees want to follow the business leader with a good business plan. Volunteers want to join the pastor with a good ministry plan. Children want to be with the adult who has the well-thought-out vacation plan. If you practice strategic thinking, others will listen to you and they will want to follow you. If you possess a position of leadership in an organization, strategic thinking is essential. H.O.W. to release the power of strategic thinking. To become a better strategic thinker able to formulate and implement plans that will achieve the desired objective, take the following guidelines to heart. Break down the issue. The first step in strategic thinking is to break down an issue into smaller, more manageable parts so that you can focus on them more effectively. How you do it is not as important as just doing it. You might break an issue down by function. That's what automotive innovator Henry Ford did when he created the assembly line, and that's why he said, nothing is particularly hard if you divide it into small jobs. How you break down an issue is up to you, whether it's by function, timetable, responsibility, purpose, or some other method. The point is that you need to break it down. Only one person in a million can juggle the whole thing in his head and think strategically to create solid, viable plans. Ask why before how. When most people begin using strategic thinking to solve a problem or plan a way to meet an objective, they often make the mistake of jumping the gun and trying immediately to figure out how to accomplish it. Instead of asking how, they should first ask why. If you jump right into problem-solving mode, how are you going to know all the issues? Eugene G. Gray says, thousands of engineers can design bridges, calculate strains and stresses, and draw up specifications for machines, but the great engineer is the man who can tell whether the bridge or the machine should be built at all, where it should be built, and when. Asking why helps you to think about all the reasons for decisions. It helps you to open your mind to possibilities and opportunities. 
The size of an opportunity often determines the level of resources and effort that you must invest. Big opportunities allow for big decisions. If you jump to how too quickly, you might miss that. Identify the real issues and objectives. William Feather, author of The Business of Life, said, Before it can be solved, a problem must be clearly defined. Too many people rush to solutions, and as a result they end up solving the wrong problem. To avoid that, ask probing questions to expose the real issues. Challenge all of your assumptions. Collect information even after you think you've identified the issue. You may still have to act with incomplete data, but you don't want to jump to a conclusion before you gather enough information to begin identifying the real issue. Begin by asking, what else could be the real issue? You should also remove any personal agenda. More than almost anything else, that can cloud your judgment. Discovering your real situation and objectives is a major part of the battle. Once the real issues are identified, the solutions are often simple. Review your resources. I already mentioned how important it is to be aware of your resources, but it bears repeating. A strategy that doesn't take into account resources is doomed to failure. Take an inventory. How much time do you have? How much money? What kinds of materials, supplies, or inventory do you have? What are your other assets? What liabilities or obligations will come into play? Which people on the team can make an impact? You know your own organization and profession. Figure out what resources you have at your disposal. Develop your plan. How you approach the planning process depends greatly on your profession and the size of the challenge that you're planning to tackle, so it's difficult to recommend many specifics. However, no matter how you go about planning, take this advice. Start with the obvious. When you tackle an issue or plan that way, it brings unity and consensus to the team because everyone sees those things. Obvious elements build mental momentum and initiate creativity and intensity. The best way to create a road to the complex is to build on the fundamentals. Put the right people in the right place. It's critical that you include your team as part of your strategic thinking. Before you can implement your plan, you must make sure that you have the right people in place. Even the best strategic thinking won't help if you don't take into account the people part of the equation. Look at what happens if you miscalculate. Wrong person. Problems instead of potential wrong place. Frustration instead of fulfillment wrong plan. Grief instead of growth. Everything comes together. However, when you put together all three elements, the right person, the right place, and the right plan. Keep repeating the process. My friend Olin Hendricks remarked, Strategic thinking is like showering, you have to keep doing it. If you expect to solve any major problem once, you're in for disappointment. Little things can be won easily through systems and personal discipline. But major issues need major strategic thinking time. What thing you said is really true. The will to win is worthless if you do not have the will to prepare. If you want to be an effective strategic thinker, then you need to become a continuous strategic thinker. As I was working on this chapter, I came across an article in my local paper on the celebration of the Jewish Passover and how millions of American Jews read the order of service for their Seder, or Passover meal, from a small booklet produced by Maxwell House Coffee. For more than 70 years, the coffee company has produced the booklet, called Haggadah, and during those years it has distributed more than 40 million copies of it. I remember using them all my life, said Regina Witt who is in her 50s. So does her mother, who is almost 90. It's her tradition. I think it would be very strange not to use them. 9. So how did Maxwell House come to supply the booklets? It was the result of strategic thinking. 80 years ago, marketing man Joseph Jacobs advised that the company could sell coffee during Passover if the product were certified kosher by rabbi. Since 1923, Maxwell House Coffee has been certified kosher for Passover. And then Jacobs suggested that if they gave away the Haggadah booklets, they could increase sales. 10. They've been creating the booklets and selling coffee during Passover ever since. That's what can happen. When you unleash the power of strategic thinking. Thinking question. Am I implementing strategic plans that give me direction for today and increase my potential for tomorrow? 6. Explore possibility thinking. 
Nothing is so embarrassing as watching someone do something that you said could not be done. S.A.M. Ling People who embrace possibility thinking are capable of accomplishing tasks that seem impossible because they believe in solutions. Here are several reasons why you should become a possibility thinker. Possibility thinking increases your possibilities when you believe you can do something difficult and you succeed many doors open for you. When George Lucas succeeded in making Star Wars, despite those who said the special effects he wanted hadn't ever been done and couldn't be done, many other possibilities opened up to him. Industrial Light and Magic ILM The company he created to produce those impossible special effects became a source of revenue to help underwrite his other projects. He was able to produce merchandising tie-ins to his movies, thus bringing in another revenue stream to fund his movie making. But his confidence in doing the difficult has also made a huge impact on other movie makers and a whole new generation of moviegoers. Popular culture writer Chris Sailwich asserts, at first directly through his own work and then via the unparalleled influence of ILM, George. Lucas has dictated for two decades the essential broad notion of what is cinema. 11. If you open yourself up to possibility thinking, you open yourself up to many other possibilities. Possibility thinking draws opportunities and people to you. The case of George Lucas helps you to see how being a possibility thinker can create new opportunities and attract people. People who think big attract big people to them. If you want to achieve big things, you need to become a possibility thinker. Possibility thinking increases others. Possibilities Big thinkers who make things happen also create possibilities for others. That happens, in part, because it's contagious. You can't help but become more confident and think bigger when you're around possibility thinkers. Possibility thinking allows you to dream big dreams no matter what your profession. Possibility thinking can help you to broaden your horizons and dream bigger dreams. Professor David J. Schwartz believes. Big thinkers are specialists in creating positive forward-looking, optimistic pictures in their own minds and in the minds of others. If you embrace possibility thinking, your dreams will go from molehill to mountain size, and because you believe in possibilities, you put yourself in position to achieve them. Possibility thinking makes it possible to rise above average during the 1970s, when oil prices went through the roof, automobile makers were ordered to make their cars more fuel efficient. One manufacturer asked a group of senior engineers to drastically reduce the weight of cars they were designing. They worked on the problem and searched for solutions, but they finally concluded that making lighter cars couldn't be done, would be too expensive, and would present too many safety concerns. They couldn't get out of the rut of their average thinking. What was the automaker's solution? They gave the problem to a group of less experienced engineers. The new group found ways to reduce the weight of the company's automobiles by hundreds of pounds. Because they thought that solving the problem was possible, it was. Every time you remove the label of impossible from a task, you raise your potential from average to off the charts. Possibility thinking gives you energy. A direct correlation exists between possibility thinking and the level of a person's energy. Who gets energized by the prospect of losing? If you know something can't succeed. How much time and energy are you willing to give it? Nobody goes looking for a lost cause. You invest yourself in what you believe can succeed. When you embrace possibility thinking, you believe in what you're doing, and that gives you energy. Possibility thinking keeps you from giving up. Above all, possibility thinkers believe they can succeed. Dennis Waitley, author of The Psychology of Winning, says, The winners in life think constantly in terms of, I can, I will and I am losers, on the other hand, concentrate their waking thoughts on what they should have done, or what they don't do. If you believe you can't do something, then it doesn't matter how hard you try, because you've already lost. If you believe you can do something, you have already won much of the battle. One of the people who showed himself to be a great possibility thinker in 2001 was New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani. In the hours following the World Trade Center tragedy, Giuliani not only led the city through the chaos of the disaster, but he instilled confidence in everyone he touched. Afterward, he gave some insight and perspective on his experience. I was so proud of the people I saw on the street. No chaos, but they were frightened and confused, and it seemed to me that they needed to hear from my heart where I thought we were going. I was trying to think, 
Where can I go for some comparison to this, some lessons about how to handle it? So I started thinking about Churchill, started thinking that we're going to have to rebuild the spirit of the city, and what better example than Churchill and the people of London during the Blitz in 1940, who had to keep up their spirit during this sustained bombing. It was a comforting thought. 12. 16 hours after the plane struck the buildings in New York City, when Giuliani finally returned at 2.30 a.m. to his apartment for a rest, instead of sleeping, he read the World War I chapters of Churchill, a biography by Roy Jenkins. He learned how Winston Churchill helped his people to see the possibilities and kept his people going. Inspired, Giuliani did the same for his own people six decades later. H.O.W. to feel the energy of possibility thinking. If you are a naturally positive person who already embraces possibility thinking, then you're already tracking with me. However, some people, rather than being optimistic, are naturally negative or cynical. They believe that possibility thinkers are naive or foolish. If your thinking runs towards pessimism, let me ask you a question. How many highly successful people do you know who are continually negative? How many impossibility thinkers are you acquainted with who achieve big things? None. People with an it-can't-be-done mindset have two choices. They can expect the worst and continually experience it, or they can change their thinking. That's what George Lucas did. Believe it or not, even though he is a possibility thinker, he is not a naturally positive person. He says, I'm very cynical, and as a result, I think the defense I have against it is to be optimistic. 13. In other words, he chooses to think positively. He sums it up this way. As corny as it sounds, the power of positive thinking goes a long way. So determination and positive thinking combined with talent combined with knowing your craft. That may sound like a naive point of view, but at the same time it's worked for me and it's worked for all my friends so I have come to believe it. 14. If you want possibility thinking to work for you, then begin by following these suggestions. Stop focusing on the impossibilities. The first step in becoming a possibility thinker is to stop yourself from searching for and dwelling on what's wrong with any given situation. Sports psychologist Bob Rotellery counts. I tell people, if you don't want to get into positive thinking, that's okay. Just eliminate all the negative thoughts from your mind, and whatever's left will be fine. If possibility thinking is new to you, you're going to have to give yourself a lot of coaching to eliminate some of the negative self-talk you may hear in your head. When you automatically start listing all the things that can go wrong or all the reasons something can't be done, stop yourself and say, don't go there. Then ask, what's right about this? That will help to get you started. And if negativity is a really big problem for you and pessimistic things come out of your mouth before you've even thought them through, you may need to enlist the aid of a friend or family member to alert you every time you utter negative ideas. Stay away from the experts. So-called experts do more to shoot down people's dreams than just about anybody else. Possibility thinkers are very reluctant to dismiss anything as impossible. Rocket pioneer Werner von Braun said, I have learned to use the word impossible with the greatest of caution. And Napoleon Bonaparte declared, The word impossible is not in my dictionary. If you feel you must take the advice of an expert, however, then eat the words of John Andrew Holmes, who asserted, Never tell a young person that something cannot be done. God may have been waiting centuries for somebody ignorant enough of the impossible to do that thing. If you want to achieve something, give yourself permission to believe it is possible. No matter what experts might say, look for possibilities in every situation. Becoming a possibility thinker is more than just refusing to let yourself be negative. It's something more. It's looking for positive possibilities despite the circumstances. I recently heard Don Soderquist, former president of Walmart, tell a wonderful story that illustrates how a person can find positive possibilities in any situation. Soderquist had gone with Sam Walton to Huntsville, Alabama, to open several new stores. Well there. Walton suggested they visit the competition. Here's what Soderquist said happened. 15. We went into one store, and I have to tell you that it was the worst store I've ever seen in my life. It was terrible. There were no customers. There was no help on the floor. The aisles were cluttered with merchandise, 
empty shelves. Dirty. It was absolutely terrible. He, Walton, walked one way and I'd walk the other way and we'd kind of meet out on the sidewalk. He said, what did you think, Don? I said, Sam, that is the absolutely worst store I've ever seen in my life. I mean, did you see the aisles? He said, Don, did you see the pantyhose rack? I said, no, I didn't, Sam. I must have gone on a different aisle than you. I didn't see that. He said, that was the best pantyhose rack I've ever seen, Don. And he said, I pulled the fixture out and on the back was the name of the manufacturer. When we get back, I want you to call that manufacturer and have him come in and visit with our fixture people. I want to put that rack in our stores. It's absolutely the best I've ever seen. And he said next, did you see the ethnic cosmetics? I said, Sam, that must have been right next to the pantyhose rack, because I absolutely missed that. He said, Don, do you realize that in our stores we have four feet of ethnic cosmetics? These people had 12 feet of it. We are absolutely missing the boat. I wrote down the distributor of some of those products. When we get back, I want you to get a hold of our cosmetic buyer and get these people in. We absolutely need to expand our ethnic cosmetics. Now, Sam Walton didn't hit me on the head and say, Don, now what lesson did you learn from this? He had already hit me on the head by looking for the good, looking how to improve, striving for excellence. It's so easy to go and look at what other people do badly. But one of the leadership, characteristics of vision that he showed me, and I'll never forget it, is look for the good in what other people are doing and apply it. It doesn't take a genius IQ or 20 years of experience to find the possibility in every situation. All it takes is the right attitude, and anybody can cultivate that. Dream one size bigger. One of the best ways to cultivate a possibility mindset is to prompt yourself to dream one size bigger than you normally do. Let's face it, most people dream too small. They don't think big enough. Henry Curtis advises, make your plans as fantastic as you like, because 25 years from now, they will seem mediocre. Make your plans 10 times as great as you first planned, and 25 years from now you will wonder why you did not make them 50 times as great. If you push yourself to dream more expansively, to imagine your organization one size bigger, to make your goals at least a step beyond what makes you comfortable, you will be forced to grow. And it will set you up to believe in greater possibilities. Question the status quo. Most people want their lives to keep improving, yet they value peace and stability at the same time. People often forget that you can't improve and still stay the same. Growth means change. Change requires challenging the status quo. If you want greater possibilities, you can't settle for what you have now. When you become a possibility thinker, you will face many people who will want you to give up your dreams and embrace the status quo. Achievers refuse to accept the status quo. As you begin to explore greater possibilities for yourself, your organization, or your family and others challenge you for it take comfort in knowing that right now as you read this, other possibility thinkers across the country and around the world are thinking about curing cancer developing new energy sources, feeding hungry people, and improving quality of life. They are challenging the status quo against the odds and you should, too, find inspiration from great achievers. You can learn a lot about possibility thinking by studying great achievers. I mentioned George Lucas in this chapter. Perhaps he doesn't appeal to you, or you don't like the movie industry. Personally, I'm not a big science fiction fan, but I admire Lucas as a thinker creative visionary, and business person. Find some achievers you admire and study them. Look for people with the attitude of Robert F. Kennedy, who popularized George Bernard Shaw's stirring statement, some men see things as they are and say, why? I dream of things that never were and say, why not? I know possibility thinking isn't in style with many people. So call it what you like, the will to succeed, belief in yourself, confidence in your ability, Faith. It's really true. People who believe they can't, don't. But if you believe you can, you can. That's the power of possibility thinking. Think in question. Am I unleashing the enthusiasm of possibility thinking to find solutions for even seemingly impossible situations? 7. 
learn from reflective thinking, to doubt everything or to believe everything are two equally convenient solutions, both dispense with the necessity of reflection. Jules Henry Poincar Copyright The pace of our society does not encourage reflective thinking. Most people would rather act than think. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a person of action. I have very high energy and I like to see things accomplished. But I'm also a reflective thinker. Reflective thinking is like the crockpot of the mind. It encourages your thoughts to simmer until they are done. As I go through this process, my goal is to reflect so that I might learn from my successes and mistakes, discover what I should try to repeat, and determine what I should change. It is always a valuable exercise. By mentally visiting past situations, you can think with greater understanding. Reflective thinking gives you true perspective when our children were young and still lived at home. We used to take them on wonderful vacations every year. When we got home, they always knew that I was going to ask them two questions. What did you like best? And what did you learn? It didn't matter whether we went to Walt Disney World or Washington, D.C. C. I always asked those questions. Why? Because I wanted them to reflect on their experiences. Children don't naturally grasp the value, or cost, of an experience unless prompted. They take things for granted. I wanted my children to appreciate their trips and to learn from them. When you reflect, you are able to put an experience into perspective. You are able to evaluate its timing. And you are able to gain a new appreciation for things that before went unnoticed. Most people are able to recognize the sacrifices of their parents or other people only when they become parents themselves. That's the kind of perspective that comes with reflection. Reflective thinking gives emotional integrity to your thought life. Few people have good perspective in the heat of an emotional moment. Most individuals who enjoy the thrill of an experience try to go back and recapture it without first trying to evaluate it. It's one of the reasons our culture produces so many thrill seekers. Likewise, those who survive a traumatic experience usually avoid similar situations at all costs, which sometimes ties them into emotional knots. Reflective thinking enables you to distance yourself from the intense emotions of particularly good or bad experiences and see them with fresh eyes. You can see the thrills of the past in the light of emotional maturity and examine tragedies in the light of truth and logic. That process can help a person to stop carrying around a bunch of negative emotional baggage. President George Washington observed, We ought not to look back unless it is to derive useful lessons from past errors, and for the purpose of profiting by dearly bought experience. Any feeling that can stand up to the light of truth and can be sustained over time has emotional integrity and is therefore worthy of your mind and heart. Reflective thinking increases your confidence in decision-making. Have you ever made a snap judgment and later wondered if you did the right thing? Everybody has. Reflective thinking can help to diffuse that doubt. It also gives you confidence for the next decision. Once you've reflected on an issue, you don't have to repeat every step of the thinking process when you're faced with it again. You've got mental road markers from having been there before. That compresses and speeds up thinking time and it gives you confidence. And over time, it can also strengthen your intuition. Reflective thinking clarifies the big picture. When you engage in reflective thinking, you can put ideas and experiences into a more accurate context. Reflective thinking encourages us to go back and spend time pondering what we have done and what we have seen. If a person who loses his job reflects on what happened, he may see a pattern of events that led to his dismissal. He will better understand what happened, why it happened, and what things were his responsibility. If he also looks at the incidents that occurred afterward, he may realize that in the larger scheme of things, he's better off in his new position because it better fits his skills and desires. Without reflection, it can be very difficult to see the big picture. Reflective thinking takes a good experience and makes it a valuable experience when you were just starting out in your career. Did it seem that few people were willing to give someone without experience an opportunity? At the same time, could you see people who had been on their jobs 20 years who yet did their work poorly? If so, that probably frustrated you. Playwright William Shakespeare wrote, Experience is a jewel, and it had need be so, for it is often purchased at an infinite rate. Yet, Experience alone does not add value to life. It's not necessarily experience that is valuable. 
It's the insight people gain because of their experience. Reflective thinking turns experience into insight. Mark Twain said, We should be careful to get out of an experience all the wisdom that is in it not like the cat that sits down on a hot stove lid. She will never sit down on a hot stove lid again and that is well, but also, she will never sit down on a cold one anymore. 16 An experience becomes valuable when it informs or equips us to meet new experiences. Reflective thinking helps to do that. HOW to embrace the lessons of reflective thinking If you're like most people in our culture today, you probably do very little reflective thinking. If that's the case, it may be holding you back more than you think. Take to heart the following suggestions to increase your ability to think reflectively. Set aside time for reflection. Greek philosopher Socrates observed, the unexamined life is not worth living. For most people, however, reflection and self-examination doesn't come naturally. It can be a fairly uncomfortable activity for a variety of reasons. They have a hard time staying focused. They find the process dull. Or they don't like spending a lot of time thinking about emotionally difficult issues. But if you don't carve out the time for it, you're unlikely to do any reflective thinking. Remove yourself from distractions. As much as any other kind of thinking, reflection requires solitude. Distraction and reflection simply don't mix. It's not the kind of thing you can do while near a television, in a cubicle, while the phone is ringing, or with children in the same room. One of the reasons I've been able to accomplish much and keep growing personally is that I've not only set aside time to reflect, but I've separated myself from distractions for short blocks of time. 30 minutes in the spa, an hour outside on a rock in my backyard, or a few hours in a comfortable chair in my office. The place doesn't matter as long as you remove yourself from distractions and interruptions. Regularly review your calendar or journal. Most people use their calendar as a planning tool, which it is. But few people use it as a reflective thinking. 2. What could be better, however, for helping you to review where you have been and what you have done? Except maybe a journal. I'm not a journaler in the regular sense. I don't use writing to figure out what I'm thinking and feeling. Instead, I figure out what I'm thinking and feeling, and then I write down significant thoughts and action points. I file the thoughts so that I can quickly put my hands on them again. I immediately execute the action points or delegate them to someone else. Calendars and journals remind you of how you've spent your time, show you whether your activities match your priorities, and help you see whether you're making progress. They also offer you an opportunity to recall activities that you might not have had the time to reflect on previously. Some of the most valuable thoughts you've ever had may have been lost because you didn't give yourself the reflection time you needed. Ask the right questions. The value you receive from a reflecting will depend on the kinds of questions you ask yourself. The better the questions, the more gold you will mine from your thinking. When I reflect, I think in terms of my values, relationships, and experiences. Here are some sample questions. Personal growth. What have I learned today that will help me grow? How can I apply it to my life? When should I apply it? Adding value. To whom did I add value today? How do I know I added value to that person? Can I follow up and compound the positive benefit he or she received? Leadership. Did I lead by example today? Did I lift my people and organization to a higher level? What did I do and how did I do it? Personal faith. Did I represent God well today? Did I practice the golden rule? Have I walked the second mile with someone? Marriage and family. Did I communicate love to my family today? How did I show that love? Did they feel it? Did they return it? Inner circle. Have I spent enough time with my key players? What can I do to help them be more successful? In what areas can I mentor them? Discoveries. What did I encounter today to which I need to give more thinking time? Are there lessons to be learned? Are there things to be done? How you organize your reflection time is up to you. You may want to adapt my pattern to your own values. Or you can try a system that my friend Dick Biggs uses. He creates three columns on a sheet of paper. Year turning point impact. This system is good for reflecting on the bigger picture. Dick used it to see patterns in his life, such as when he moved to Atlanta and was encouraged by a new teacher to write. You could just as easily write, event, 
significance and action point on a page to help you benefit from reflective thinking. The main thing is to create questions that work for you and write down any significant thoughts that come to you during the reflection time. Cement your learning through action. Writing down the good thoughts that come out of your reflective thinking has value, but nothing helps you to grow like putting your thoughts into action. To do that, you must be intentional. When you read a good book, for example, there are always good thoughts, quotes, or lessons that you can take away from it and use yourself. I always mark the takeaways in a book and then reread them when I'm done with the book. When I listen to a message, I record the takeaways so that I can file them for future use. When I go to a seminar, I take good notes, and I use a system of symbols to cue me to do certain things. An arrow like this means to look at this material again. An asterisk like this asterisk next to a marked section means to file it according to the subject noted. A bracket like this means that I want to use what's marked in a lecture or book. An arrow like this means this idea will take off if I work at it. When most people go to a conference or seminar, they enjoy the experience, listen to the speakers, and sometimes even take notes. But nothing happens after they go home. They like many of the concepts they hear, but when they close their notebooks, they don't think about them again. When that happens, they receive little more than a temporary surge of motivation. When you go to a conference, revisit what you heard, reflect on it, and then put it into action. It can change your life. Ultimately, reflective thinking has three main values. It gives me perspective within context. It allows me to continually connect with my journey, and it provides counsel and direction concerning my future. It is an invaluable tool to my personal growth. Few things in life can help me learn and improve the way reflective thinking can. Thinking question. Am I regularly revisiting the past to gain a true perspective and think with understanding? 8. Question popular thinking. I'm not an answering machine, I'm a questioning machine. If we have all the answers, how come we're in such a mess? Douglas Cardinal. Economist John Maynard Keynes, whose ideas profoundly influenced economic theory and practices in the 20th century, asserted, the difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as in escaping from the old ones. Going against popular thinking can be difficult, whether you're a business person ducking company tradition, a pastor introducing new types of music to his church, a new mother rejecting old wives, tales handed down from her parents, or a teenager ignoring currently popular styles. Many of the ideas in this book go against popular thinking. If you value popularity over good thinking, then you will severely limit your potential to learn the types of thinking encouraged by this book. Popular thinking is too average to understand the value of good thinking, too inflexible to realize the impact of changed thinking, too lazy to master the process of intentional thinking, too small to see the wisdom of big picture thinking, too satisfied to unleash the potential of focused thinking, too traditional to discover the joy of creative thinking too naive to recognize the importance of realistic thinking, too undisciplined to release the power of strategic thinking, too limiting to feel the energy of possibility thinking, too trendy to embrace the lessons of reflective thinking, too shallow to question the acceptance of popular thinking, too proud to encourage the participation of shared thinking, too self-absorbed to experience the satisfaction of unselfish thinking, and too uncommitted to enjoy the return of bottom-line thinking. If you want to become a good thinker, then start preparing yourself for the possibility of becoming unpopular. WH why you should question the acceptance of popular thinking I've given you some broad reasons for questioning the acceptance of popular thinking. Now allow me to be more specific. Popular thinking sometimes means not thinking. My friend Kevin Myers sums up the idea of popular thinking by saying, the problem with popular thinking is that it doesn't require you to think at all. Good thinking is hard work. If it were easy, everybody would be a good thinker. Unfortunately, many people try to live life the easy way. They don't want to do the hard work of thinking or pay the price of success. It's easier to do what other people do and hope that they thought it out. Look at the stock market recommendations of some experts. By the time they publish their picks, most are following a trend, not creating one or even riding its crest. The people who are going to make money on the stocks they recommend have already done so by the time the general public hears about it. 
when people blindly follow a trend, they are not doing their own thinking. Popular thinking offers false hope. Ben O'Muller Hill, a professor in the University of Cologne Genetics Department, tells how one morning in high school he stood last in a line of 40 students in the schoolyard. His physics teacher had set up a telescope so that his students could view a planet and its moons. The first student stepped up to the telescope. He lit through it, but when the teacher asked if he could see anything, the boy said no. His nearsightedness hampered his view. The teacher showed him how to adjust the focus, and the boy finally said he could see the planet and moons. One by one, the students stepped up to the telescope and saw what they were supposed to see. Finally, the second to last student looked into the telescope and announced that he could not see anything. You idiot, shouted the teacher, you have to adjust the lenses. The student tried, but he finally said, I still can't see anything. It is all black. The teacher, disgusted, looked through the telescope himself, and then looked up with a strange expression. The lens cap still covered the telescope. None of the students had been able to see anything. 17. Many people look for safety and security in popular thinking. They figure that if a lot of people are doing something, then it must be right. It must be a good idea. If most people accept it, then it probably represents fairness, equality, compassion, and sensitivity, right? Not necessarily. Popular thinking said the Earth was the center of the universe, yet Copernicus studied the stars and planets and proved mathematically that the Earth and the other planets in our solar system revolved around the Sun. Popular thinking said surgery didn't require clean instruments, yet Joseph Lister studied the high death rates in hospitals and introduced antiseptic practices that immediately saved lives. Popular thinking said that women shouldn't have the right to vote. Yet people like Emmeline Pankhurst and Susan B. Anthony fought for and won that right. Popular thinking put the Nazis into power in Germany, yet Hitler's regime murdered millions and nearly destroyed Europe. We must always remember there is a huge difference between acceptance and intelligence. People may say that there's safety in numbers, but that's not always true. Sometimes it's painfully obvious that popular thinking isn't good and right. Other times it's less evident. For example, Consider the staggering number of people in the United States who have run up large amounts of debt on their credit cards. Anyone who is financially astute will tell you that's a bad idea. Yet millions follow right along with the popular thinking of buy now, pay later. And so they pay, and pay, and pay. Many promises of popular thinking ring hollow. Don't let them fool you. Popular thinking is slow to embrace change. Popular thinking loves the status quo. It puts its confidence in the idea of the moment, and holds on to it with all its might. As a result, it resists change and dampens innovation. Donald M. Nelson, former president of the Society of Independent Motion Picture Producers, criticized popular thinking when he asserted, we must discard the idea that past routine, past ways of doing things, are probably the best ways. On the contrary, we must assume that there is probably a better way to do almost everything. We must stop assuming that a thing which has never been done before probably cannot be done at all. Popular thinking brings only average results. The bottom line. Popular thinking brings mediocre results. Here is popular thinking in a nutshell. Popular equals normal equals average. It's the least of the best and the best of the least. We limit our success when we adopt popular thinking. It represents putting in the least energy to just get by. You must reject common thinking if you want to accomplish uncommon results. HOW to question the acceptance of popular thinking Popular thinking has often proved to be wrong and limiting. Questioning it isn't necessarily hard, once you cultivate the habit of doing so. The difficulty is in getting started. Begin by doing the following things. Think before you follow. Many individuals follow others almost automatically. Sometimes they do so because they desire to take the path of least resistance. Other times they fear rejection. Or they believe there is wisdom in doing what everyone else does. But if you want to succeed, you need to think about what's best, not what's popular. Challenging popular thinking requires a willingness to be unpopular and go outside of the norm. Following the tragedy of September the 11th, 2001, for example, few people willingly chose to travel by plane. But that was the best time to travel. 
crowds were down, security was up, and airlines were cutting prices. About a month after the tragedy, my wife, Margaret, and I heard that Broadway shows had lots of seats and many New York hotel rooms remained empty. Popular thinking said, stay away from New York. We used that as an opportunity. We got cheap plane tickets to the city, booked a room in a great hotel for about half price, and got tickets to the most sought-after show, the producers. As we took our seats in the theatre, we sat next to a woman beside herself with excitement. I can't believe I'm finally here, she said to us. I've waited so long. This is the best show on Broadway. And the hardest to get tickets to. Then she turned to look me in the eye and said, I've had my tickets for a year and a half, waiting to see this show. How long ago did you get yours? You won't like my answer, I replied. Oh, come on, she said. How long? I got mine five days ago, I answered. She looked at us in horror. By the way, she was right. It's one of the best shows we've seen in a while. And we got to see it only because we were willing to go against popular thinking when everyone else was staying at home. As you begin to think against the grain of popular thinking, remind yourself that unpopular thinking, even one resulting in success, is largely underrated, unrecognized, and misunderstood. Unpopular thinking contains the seeds of vision and opportunity. Unpopular thinking is required for all progress. The next time you feel ready to conform to popular thinking on an issue, stop and think. You may not want to create change for its own sake, but you certainly don't want to blindly follow just because you haven't thought about what's best. Appreciate thinking different from your own. One of the ways to embrace innovation and change is to learn to appreciate how others think. To do that, you must continually expose yourself to people different from yourself. My brother. Larry Maxwell a good businessman and an innovative thinker continually challenges popular thinking by thinking differently. He says, most of our people in sales and middle management come from businesses with products and services different from ours. That constantly exposes us to new ways of thinking. We also discourage our people from active participation in formal business and trade associations and fraternities because their thinking is quite common. They don't need to spend lots of time thinking the way everyone else in the industry does. As you strive to challenge popular thinking, spend time with people with different backgrounds, education levels, professional experiences, personal interests, etc. You will think like the people with whom you spend the most time. If you spend time with people who think out of the box, you're more likely to challenge popular thinking and break new ground. Continually question your own thinking. Let's face it, any time we find a way of thinking that works, one of our greatest temptations is to go back to it repeatedly, even if it no longer works well. The greatest enemy to tomorrow's success is sometimes today's success. My friend Andy Stanley recently taught a leadership lesson at Enjoy's Catalyst conference called Challenging the Process. He described how progress must be preceded by change and he pointed out many of the dynamics involved in questioning popular thinking. In an organization, he said, we should remember that every tradition was originally a good idea and perhaps even revolutionary. But every tradition may not be a good idea for the future. In your organization, if you were involved in putting into place what currently exists, then it's likely that you will resist change even change for the better. That's why it's important to challenge your own thinking. If you're too attached to your own thinking and how everything is done now, then nothing will change for the better. Try new things in new ways. When was the last time you did something for the first time? Do you avoid taking risks or trying new things? One of the best ways to get out of the rut of your own thinking is to innovate. You can do that in little, everyday ways. Drive to work a different way from normal. Order an unfamiliar dish at your favorite restaurant. Ask a different colleague to help you with a familiar project. Take yourself off of autopilot. Unpopular thinking asks questions and seeks options. In 1997, my three companies moved to Atlanta, Georgia. It's a great city, but traffic at peak times can get crazy. Immediately after moving here, I began looking for and testing alternative routes to desired destinations so that I would not be caught in traffic. From my house to the airport, For example, I have discovered and used nine routes within 8 miles and 12 minutes from one another. 
Often I am amazed to see people sitting on the freeway when they could be moving forward on an alternative route. What is the problem? Too many people have not tried new things and new ways. It is true. Most people are more satisfied with old problems than committed to finding new solutions. How you go about doing new things in new ways is not as important as making sure you do it. Besides, if you try to do new things in the S.